Under the burden of the Black Knight of Humanity, rekindled by current international events, they still live in my thoughts, full of life, the comrades with whom one fine day, sheltered by the symbols of Mexico, we sailed into the sun to fight for peace and freedom. Ricardo Blanco, member of the Mexican Expeditionary Air Force, the 201st squadron known as the Aztec Eagles. Five, four, three, ten. Oh no. Polly here on the Latino Slant. So good to be here with you. Uh, if Make sure you are subscribed to the channel and that uh, you consider becoming a member of the channel. We have a lot of great perks. So check out all the links below in the video description. And comment. Please give us a comment, especially on today's video. Wow. This is an amazing story. The 201st Squadron from Mexico that fought in World War II. From the Daily Planet, our good friends at the Daily Planet, they give us this story. The 201st Squadron, Mexico's Greatest Generation by Gustavo Vasquez Lozano. The Mexicans did not fight Nazi Germany nor in Italian fascism, but Japanese imperialism in Luzon and Formosa. Historians agree that Mexico's main contribution to World War II was to provide the U.S. with precious raw materials, especially oil, sorely needed in the war front across the ocean. But few knew that in Mexico, in addition to Brazil, was the only country in Latin America to send troops against the Berlin-Rome-Tokyo axis. Wow, I did not know that. This is the story of the 201st Squadron, known as the Aztec Eagles, a group of 30 Mexican combat pilots, most of them in their early 20s, who fought in the Philippines under legendary General Douglas MacArthur. It was the first time in Mexico's history, a country with a strong non-intervention policy at the time, that armed forces were sent overseas. But at the end of 1944, when the Mexican contingent across, crossed the U.S. border for training, the war was almost over. Thus, the Aztec Eagles flew through the last rapidly closing gap in order to finish on the side of the victors. Its arrival in the Far East was a shot in the arm for the Allies on the brutal Pacific Front. The Mexicans did not fight Nazi Germany nor Italian fascism, but Japanese imperialism uh, in Luzon and Formosa. The mission dripped with symbolism. During colonial times, the Philippines had been administered from New Spain, modern-day Mexico, same history, guys, as modern-day Mexico. Mexicans had read of the atrocities of the Japanese occupation in newspapers and the battle to liberate the Arpelagio. Oh, and I had practiced this word. Archipelago. <laughs> Excuse me. Archipelago was a cause that could they could get behind. And there, uh, General Douglas MacArthur welcomes the Mexican force. Great photo. Negotiations for the war. To a large extent, it was the vision of the American ambassador to Mexico, George Messersmith, who recognized this historic opportunity, which made the involvement of the Mexican contingent possible. Ambassador Messersmith met President Roosevelt in early 1944 in order to inform him of the Mexican situation. Mexican generals were keen to join the combat. Messersmith confided in the president that the best option would be to deploy one to three air squadrons. He also told them that Mexico's involvement would be more for political ends than out of necessity. Messer Smith received instructions to meet with the Mexican president, Manuel Avila Camacho, to inform him that the involvement of one to three air squadrons would be well received by the U.S. Pilot selection began in 1944. The strongest candidates floated to the top among A Aviation Academy graduates. Competition was fierce. There were a few outcasts and orphans mixed with rich boys. I was a very humble boy, recalled pilot Miguel Moreno uh, Ariola, 
for the Los Angeles Times in 2004. I was an orphan, and I didn't get there because I was privileged. I earned it. I wanted to help. They were all upper class, but I was very proud of myself. I was self-made. The volunteers came from both the northern and southeastern states of Mexico, from cities and farms. Among the land-based staff, there was a young man who had worked as a reporter for the English newspaper, the Mexico City Herald, and a cook from a pastry in uh, Mexico City. Mexican eagles over the Pacific. Uh, here's a squadron. And they're arriving in Manila. That's a great shot. That's a good shot. Um, the boys of the 201st Squadron docked in Manila Bay on the morning of May 1st, 1945. Manila had, a, Manila had already been liberated from the Japanese, but Japan had not surrendered yet. The Mexicans received their baptism uh, of fire when they formed a, com a complete detachment wing made up of the U.S. fighter pilots. Before the men boarded their aircraft, they were all advised to write letters to their families in case they did not survive the mission. Ah, in May, in late May 1945, the squadron was given its first independent mission to attack a cluster of jacket, Japanese troops near the coast of Luzon. The mission was to the mission was communicated to the squad's leader, Captain uh, Radames Gaxiola Andrade. The planes took off at eight o'clock in the morning, flying at a lower altitude over idyllic rainforest landscapes and waterfalls where intense combat was taking place. Their objective was to support the ground troops conquering Philippine territory by bombing enemy bases, buildings, vehicles, artillery, and troops. In June, the U.S. troops intensified their march through the jungle, and the most ruthless phase of the fighting began. The backdrop to the battle against the troops of Tomoyuka uh, Yamashita, Move from the rice paddies to the mountains. Such a delicate situation meant backup from the air was vital. Although the targets were becoming harder to locate as the action moved deeper within the jungle and the enemy all but disappeared into the foliage. The planes of the 201st Squadron would approach the area one by one, diving down in the face of enemy fire, dropping their bombs, and then ascending again just in time to avoid being hit by the flying debris and battling the enormous gravitational pressure that would cause pilots to faint. And there is uh, Lieutenant uh, Castro and Lieutenant uh, Urias, Urias in the Philippines. Quote, we got it into our heads. We were going to show the Americans what we could do, what we were made of, recalled pilot Reynaldo Gallardo two years later. Get near the target. Make sure I hit it and hit it good to cause as much damage as I could, then quickly turn around and get out of there. The Americans asked me, hey, who's that guy doing the circles over the target? It's Pancho Pistolas. I laughed. <laughs> okay. In early July, the Allies began their frontal attack on Japanese territory. The 201st Squadron was assigned a mission even riskier than the previous ones, to go ahead of the U.S. Navy and sweep the stretch of sea going from Manila to Okinawa, passing over the island of Formosa, modern-day Taiwan, a stronghold of the Japanese. The final act of the War of the Pacific began with the invasion of Okinawa. The 201st Squadron, lacking in operative capacity due to the death of five command pilots, did not participate in the invasion. Mexican replacements were already being trained up in the States, but the surrender of the Japanese Empire following Hiroshima and Nagasaki eliminated any possibility of sending a new generation to the fighting front. Flight into oblivion. While it's true that World War II was already won before the Mexicans arrived, that was not their true motive for going. Mexico risked more than what was necessary, not merely to cooperate with a cause that many citizens supported, liberating the people of the Philippines, with whom Mexico had shared a 300-year history, but also to earn itself a place in the United Nations, in particularly, in particularly to reestablish its relationship with the U.S. on more equitive grounds. On November 18, 1945, they received a hero's welcome in Mexico City when the train pulled in. Hundreds of people were waiting there to see their returning soldiers. Surprisingly, Mexican historians showed little interest in the squadron. In the U.S., the soldiers of the Second World War became the greatest generation. In Mexico, they were soon but all 
all but forgotten. There is only one survivor at the time of this writing, Carlos Garduño Nunez, 100 years old when he dies. The extraordinary generation of which he was a part of will have taken its last breath. Wow. And you can now um, check out their book here on Amazon. And I just wanted to show you a couple of images before we close out. Beautiful photo there. And there will be an, an addendum video. I'm going to read the first chapter of this book to you guys, which I think is pretty amazing. A lot of Mexican history from 1900 to about 1940 that I did not know of. And let's give you one last one. <clears throat> this is Mexican propaganda right there. The Mexican eagle with its uh, colors tearing up the Yahtzee flag. Pretty intense. Pretty intense. Well, please leave your comments below. Let us know what you think about this. Uh, did you know about the Aztec eagles? I want to thank the Daily Chela. Uh, incredible story. And we'll put a link to the book as well. Let us know what you think. I definitely did not know about uh, the Mexican Eagles. I knew about our uh, Latino Americans that fought, including uh, my great uh, uncle and my grandfather who's, who fought. And uh, pretty amazing stuff. Pretty amazing stuff. But that's what history is all about. And I'm glad that we can uh, share this video with you guys. Love, peace. We'll see you the next time. A la próxima. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. It's lamp. Yeah, but isn't this the unplugged version? I don't know. I think, I think it's the unplugged version. All right, Power, let's go. Listen, y'all, just go ahead and let the guests play. Come on, cheese.